Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion on cooperative intelligent transportation systems and V2X, or Vehicle to Everything. I'm Nino DiCara, founder of Electric Autonomy Canada, and I'm delighted to moderate today's discussion, which is sponsored by Autocrypt. Autocrypt is a cybersecurity solutions provider dedicated to the safety of connected and autonomous transportation. Its solutions secure the rapidly evolving framework of transportation and infrastructure from start to finish, whether it be devices, the electricity grid, connecting to a network, uh, to other vehicles, or to surrounding infrastructure. We're grateful for Autocrypt support, and I encourage you to check out their website for more details on some of the cool work that they're doing. Right, well, on, on to today's session. Uh, some sobering uh, numbers. Uh, on an average day on Canada's roads, four people are killed and another 400 are injured. And that's according to pre-pandemic data from Transport Canada. And um, the majority of those accidents are caused by human error, 95% according to a, a US study. We want that situation to improve. We've got to keep pushing into the future if we want safer and more efficient roads. The technology is, exists today to enable vehicles to communicate to each other with pedestrians and with road safety systems and other infrastructure. But it's going to take a huge effort, huge collaboration, and quite like EV charging infrastructure, it's going to take huge investment as well to create uh, these secure systems. So how do we do it? And uh, what's holding us up? Well, that's what we're here to talk about. We've got a fantastic panel of experts who have very generously um, committed, committed their time to be part of the discussion today. They are Susan Murtha, Vice President, Connected and Automated Technologies at AECOM. Charles Chang, Business Development Manager at iSmartways Technology. Asad Farouk, Manager, Strategic Initiatives at the Ontario Vehicle Innovation Network and Ontario Centre of, of Innovation. Jeffrey Decoux, Chairman of the Autonomy Institute. And Sean Cho, President and CEO of Autocrit North America. Well, welcome to everybody. Uh, really pleased to have you here today. And uh, if I could start off by inviting you to uh, each introduce yourselves. Um, and Suzanne, uh, if you'd like to kick us off. You bet. Hi, I'm Suzanne Murtha. I'm with AECOM. I'm our global lead for connected and automated technologies. That means that I get to um, I get to look at all the work that we're doing related to connectivity and automation for vehicles and transport all over the world. So I get to understand what is the best practices from each region and share that um, and share that back and around. And it is it's a blast to do that. It's an honor. Um, my background has been traditionally in connectivity. So I have worked for 20 some, 20 some years in, in, in directly um, working on direct connectivity specifically as it relates to um, connectivity around the 5.9 band. So I originally wrote some of the rules for FCC for the use of what was then DSRC um, for doing direct um, short, uh, short, very high speed, um, short distance connectivity for vehicles and infrastructure and have since been working on deploying that all over the country and supporting all over the world as well. Nino? That's awesome. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And uh, Charles, if I could invite you to go next. Uh, hi, my name is Charlie Chang. Uh, I am Business Development Manager uh, for iSmartWays. Uh, iSmartWays, we are a uh, technology provider uh, for smart transportation, uh, especially in, in the same space of CITS or V2X, uh, uh, and making, uh, for example, both hardware and software, um, as well as providing solutions and services. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, I was born and raised in Michigan, uh, and then I spent a few years uh, in China uh, working with uh, both multinational governments uh, as well as um, uh, corporations uh, and talking about really focused on, uh, let's say, connected autonomous vehicles. Uh, and I do come from a little bit of, a, of an automotive background. Pleasure to meet you. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Charles. And uh, Asad, over to you. Thanks, Nino. My name is Asad Parukh. I'm the manager of strategic initiatives at Ontario Vehicle Innovation Network, or as it is known by many, OVEN. 
At Oven, uh, I'm currently overseeing multiple strategic domestic and cross-border initiatives that are aimed at catalyzing innovative solutions and commercialization efforts for the future of automotive and mobility sector. For, for people who, um, to give a bit of a background on Oven, it is an Ontario's flagship initiative that is really spearheading and fostering the commercialization of, of advanced automotive technologies and smart mobility solutions, including the CITS, the core of the discussion today. And we're also working on a work so workforce development and the uh, future preparation and readiness of the workforce in this sector. Previously, I have worked uh, with one of the leading technology services company and uh, one of the largest multinational lateral institutions, the G20, where I worked to shape international economic development initiatives, such as the smart mobility guidelines. So very experienced, uh, very, very excited to share my experience here today. And it's an honor to be with the panel of uh, such distinguished guests. Back to you, Neil. Terrific. Thanks very much, Asad. And Jeff, over to you. Um, great to be here. I think this is an incredible panel that you put together, Nino. Um, so Jeff Tico, chairman of the Autonomy Institute. Uh, the Autonomy Institute is a 501c3 that was established after um, deep collaboration and discussions with federal agencies back in 2018 and Admiral Inman. And the whole goal is to spearhead the the investment and deployment of the intelligent infrastructure that will enable all these advanced services. So my background over you know 30 years in enterprise software, but we realized back in 2017 that we're now at the point where software and um, initiatives like transportation are be becoming integrated and there had to be a way to solve for the devices, the software, the, the technology that had to be deployed and densified to enable all these new services. So our goal is to work with large private infrastructure investors and get this these large public-private partnerships established to start building. And uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Awesome, thanks very much, Jeff. And Sean, over to you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all. And um, I'm from Autocrypt. I'm a CEO of Autocrypt North America. We have more than two decades of cybersecurity project reference and strong record with working with um, public sector, with government, and also working together with OEMs and tier one. So uh, we pretty much cover, well, today we only focus on the fleet of X, but we have pretty much specialized all the aspects of security consideration of automotive infrastructure and security itself from fleet to X, in vehicle security and other service layer and mobility service itself, and all like covering all the rounds um, all the care about the vehicle safe and all the communications. So happy to support, exciting to share about our reference and project experience to share about how important if this connected vehicle, especially if we communication could bring all the intelligence service layer, bring all together for the future of multi mobility service. Great. Thank you very much, Sean, and, and thank you to, to all the panelists. Okay, right. Well, we, we're going to get ourselves started here. And Charlie, if I could invite you to, to kick us off and just to really help d define the subject area and the landscape that we're talking about here. So with CITS and V2X, a terms used to, to broadly describe uh, vehicles communicating with each other and, uh, and other systems, which is obviously quite general. Could you explain a little more about what that means and why it's important for safe automated driving or as we you know, colloquial term self-driving you know if we're going to get to a self-driving uh, future uh, happy to be here and happy to uh, give a brief uh, overview of the terms and definitions let's say which which i think is actually very important so i start with why uh, the terms and definitions are obviously important for the public facing but they're also very important for engineers when you get down into let's say what I call systems of systems or what, what some of the industries in, in simulation call systems of systems uh, and so it's very important and, and you just stated you know the little differences that that really matter in terms of engineering uh, especially for automated vehicles uh, automated driving systems the autonomous technology self-driving car right and it even gets further you know it varies when you get into different languages different engineering and also different specifications and standards uh, and so that's why these terms and definitions ideally would be all aligned, um, but that's that's a very complex topic. Um, so so in terms of this technology that we're talking about, uh, the more commonly used uh, terms are connected vehicle. Uh, sometimes people also use a vehicle telematics. Uh, and, and then in terms of the uh, infrastructure side, uh, the more common term is the intelligent transportation systems, uh, ITS. 
Um, and so we've kind of then, uh, with the introduction of uh, V2X, this really kind of changed things. And, and this, I guess this, this panel will be, maybe be an advocacy for why uh, maybe B2X or CITS is a catalyst um, for a lot of the smart technologies in for, for cities, as well as also from the vehicle's perspective. Um, but uh, the more term for B2X, uh, the, short, the short definition is vehicle to everything, hence the X. Uh, and it can be boiled down to um, a technology that uses wireless communication uh, that communicate between vehicles and roadside infrastructure being, uh, for example, cameras, LIDAR, uh, and also uh, roadside devices. In this sense, you have an onboard vehicle that goes in, uh, into the vehicle. And also on, on the roadside, you have a roadside unit, an RSU. Uh, and both, a key benefit to these technologies is that its ability to communicate both over licensed and unlicensed wireless spectrums, meaning that you could broadcast messages over 4G, 5G, or ideally, uh, in its own dedicated spectrum, like the 5.9 gigahertz, uh, a common uh, then uh, iterations of the V2X then goes into, for example, V2I, V2V, V2Grid, like you was shown in the slide, um, uh, V2I being vehicle to infrastructure, V2V, vehicle, vehicle to vehicle, V2N also vehicle to network. Uh, and so what uh, I guess we like to boil it all down, and perhaps maybe in the East like to boil it down, is that the term of CITS. And the CITS, uh, the C stands for cooperative, I mean, that's where um, you know, being a, a Canadian Chinese um, uh, V2X provider, um, we noticed that a language in China particularly has shifted uh, where it originally it talked a lot about connected vehicles and V2X, but that has shifted to combine what they say cooperative autonomy. Uh, and that's what you're really combining now, the V2X, including both infrastructure and the vehicle uh, with, let's say, automated driving. And only through those combination can you actually achieve perhaps let's say self-driving cars, level four, level five, uh, as well as smart cities. Uh, and so the technology improves driver's awareness, uh, potential dangers, helps reduce severity. Uh, it allows both non-line of sight and line of sight communication. Uh, and, but the, I like the term CITS uh, better because it's actually talking about how it's machine to machine communication, which is very different from communicating with human uh, interaction. Uh, and also uh, like you talked about, uh, V2X is a system. Uh, and that's why also CITS is a better term because it is more of a system where you have to integrate both on the vehicle level, the infrastructure level, and also on the driver level, where you're talking about the human machine interface, how the driver receives the warning, or important information like weather patterns, nearby accidents, road conditions, road work warnings, emergency vehicles approaching. You could even talk about things like ports, parking lots, toll stations, and even perhaps, which I'm really excited for, uh, gas stations. Uh, so that's a, a, a try to boil it down as best of a term and definition uh, for CITS and V2X as I could. That's fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Charlie. That's a great scene setter for us. And Su Suzanne, could you explain how cooperative systems take intelligent transportation to the next level and the benefits that cooperation brings to vehicle and also infrastructure? Yeah, you bet. And Charlie, you did that. That was really smooth. It's almost like you've done that before. I like that a lot. <laughs> you didn't even have slides to point to with that. That was awesome. So um, next, so uh, at, at USDOT, and um, they can forgive me for not remembering exactly who it was. I think it was someone at NHTSA who said that the safest automated driving is connected automated driving, right? Meaning so that automated vehicles typically have, and someone's going to tell me that I'm wrong here, but around six different layers of sensor systems that help bring in data from inside the vehicle so that the computer can integrate all those points of data on the vehicle and, um, and understand its environment better, right? So all those systems, however, those six layers excluding communication can only understand inside the visual line of sight for the most part. So the, the advantage of having connectivity is that we can see beyond the visual line of sight. In the, in the airline industry, they call that um, BV loss, beyond visual line of sight, right? So um, this gives us the ability to see beyond corners and to see beyond vehicles in front of us, and also to be able to do direct communications with other vehicles so that vehicles can communicate with each other and communicate their intent, ultimately. When, when there's more automation, the communication enables intent so that a vehicle can explain to another vehicle and they can talk between themselves and figure out which vehicle is going to make what move right so that's an incredible opportunity we see that yes um i think that um, we understand that 
connected vehicles independent of automation can address maybe maybe 84% um, of crashes, I think is the number we used to look at. And that number comes from, uh, oh, then these are rough, right? So no chat box comments on this. Approximately 42% of uh, crashes in the US happen at intersections and approximately 42% um, are, are accidental lane departure, right? And these are two really key areas that we can address specifically with, um, with coordination, with communication. Right, so we're able to knock out a lot of um, really great, uh, a, a really a great amount of crashes with that combined with automation, right? It becomes incredibly powerful because in, indeed, I think your number is about right. About 95% of crashes are caused by humans making, you know, not great decisions, right? Approximately. And so when we can combine those two numbers, I mean, we can get really close to eliminating crashes. And, and wouldn't that be great? Because then I will have, you know, achieved, we will have achieved what we all started out in our career to do. And so that would be wonderful. Uh, and I also want to add one, one quick little plug. You know, one of the ways that we can make sure the communication works is uh, I work with, a, with an organization called Omnier, and this is a certification uh, entity. And what we work to do is to make sure that our communications are um, able to be understood um, between different types of devices. So they're all interoperable when we do the communications. And that way we can assure that the communication from Toyota match up with the communications with Ford and Honda and all those, uh, and also match up with the infrastructure communications that Charlie was talking about. Terrific. Thanks, Suzanne. And uh, so I don't know if uh, the, uh, any other panelists want to want to comment on uh, uh, Suzanne's thought there in terms of some of the, some of the benefits. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll take us directly into to the next question. Um, and Sean, the, the the communications Suzanne was referencing, the obviously bring huge benefits. But how do we ensure that the data flows um, between these systems are secure themselves so that the systems themselves don't become a risk to safety. So thanks, Nino. You know, um, the cybersecurity uh, for CITS, uh, Charlie and Suzanne mentioned, is a fascinating um, combination of technology to create um, safe and secure ecosystem for vehicles and infrastructures and all the world users. So when we explain the CITS in uh, security aspect, we I can probably explain it with the two parts, with the front end and the back end. So the front end, sometimes that is referred to as end entities that takes care of the encryption and decryption of the messages. So while the back end referred to as SCMS in the state is authentication body that allows the creation of the trust among the vehicles and infrastructures. Encryption and decryption, uh, encryption and decryption is the relies on the backend system as it utilizes a digital certificate and digital case issued by the SMS to encrypt the messages it sends and decrypt the ones it receives. So and this process is supported by a security library in the device composed of a security module that supports encryption and decryption work in a local certificate manager, which is we call the LCM, that stores and handles and digital certificates it receives from the SMS. So it, in V2X communication, which are the core of the CITS, the device is responsible for the communication, be it on board in the vehicle or as part of the road infrastructure, is required to have cybersecurity integrated to prevent hackers and other malicious third parties from disrupting the traffic and potential vulnerabilities. A pillar of uh, V2X cybersecurity is the security of the broadcast messages for privacy. This is relatively simple process that happens automatically in the vehicle without the integration interactions of the drivers and involves communication with the backend system. When a device is enrolled into the CITS ecosystem, the backend server issues unique certificates um, that can be used only by the device to authenticate itself and verify the messages of the other device on the road. So this is also the base of the how the message, messages are encrypted and decrypted. Another layer of the security is provided to the ecosystem by an entity that is responsible for authorizing the operators of the SCMS. So the structure of the system slightly varies by reason as well as operation policies, but major function of the system would be um, pretty much the same. So one section 
is responsible for the enrollment of the device. Another is for issue of the certificates. And the last section of the part is revoking the certificates of the device deemed misbehaving. So these sections are designed to work together, yet they are separate to preserve the privacy of vehicle users. So simply, this is how it works. When a new device is enrolled into the system, the enrollment authority issues an enrollment certificate and a set of data called bootstrapping data. With this bootstrapping data, the new device can communicate with certificate issuing authority that will give it a set of certificate design to keep the vehicle anonymous. So these certificates are called stunium certificates. If the vehicle is an emergency vehicle, for example, or a police cars, um, the authority gives it identification certificate so the other vehicle can identify itself as a special one. And all other necessary certificates are given to the device. A list of misbehaving devices also shared to, to the onboard unit can ignore um, the message during the driving. So the whole system is designed like an orchestra with different instruments, but the same goal to make sure CITS are secure and safe for the bad actors. Thank, thanks, Sean. Thanks for the uh, th thanks for the uh, the detail behind that. Um, so th there's no advantage in 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 vehicle to vehicle. Like how how critical is the infrastructure component? I'll just give you a chance to really speak to that. Um, I, I guess vehicle to vehicle won't live without the infrastructure. So um, so like so that's more about the questions of V2X or the V2I. So. Um, what is more important and what should be um, handled in advance. So I'm afraid this sort of like questions is like CIT's implementation aspects. It's, this is like right now, I can say uh, more about like, you know, like a little bit um, chicken and egg phase because um, the old OEM deploys more way to actually enable the vehicles or real the road operators or local government deploy um, more vehicle infrastructure on the road. For example, Korea is one of the most leading country and is investing in infrastructure that will be deployed on all the highway in the next few years. In the meanwhile, some European OEMs are releasing V2X capable vehicles in advance of wide scale infrastructure deployment. So when um, securing the front end of the ecosystem, the burden is predominantly on the vehicle and the roadside infrastructure manufacturers with um, large scale deployment of V2X technology road operators or local government will have to strongly consider the deployment of the critical backends so they can cover the all other aspect of the security requirements. So the backend operators are also expected to be responsible for establishing and maintaining backend policies and shall oversee um, the authentication of new V2X devices, for example, aftermarket one and other um, management and operation issues so um, policymaking is going to be play an essential role in the security of CITS along with the software aspect I mentioned before. So the more infrastructure um, there is, the better um, the ecosystem will be. So the better ecosystem is always more be more we will see in the various um, the benefits such as improve, improve the road safety or better road traffic, which will reduce the road congestion, et cetera. So more value we could enjoy. Um, as there is a, like more in infrastructure deployed. Perfect. Hey, Sean, um, do, you mind, do you mind if I add on to what Sean is saying? Sure, sure. And, and also, Sean, at the same time, everything you said is 100%, 100% I agree. Um, also, some of our clients in, uh, on the infrastructure side get a little bit off put when we talk about massive deployments of infrastructure. So while everything you said was absolutely right, I would also point out that we don't need massive deployments to get the benefits, to get all the benefits right. Meaning that if we have an intersection where there are a whole, where there's a problem, it's a very, very unsafe intersection. If we start with deploying some roadside units or some equipment at that intersection, um, we can be impactful and sort of um, a ripple effect, right? And then uh, and maybe less necessary to deploy a large amount of infrastructure in areas that are maybe a little bit pro more problem free, right? Right, Th Suzanne, thanks for, thanks for coming in with that point. And Sean, thanks for, uh, um, th thanks for taking us through those, uh, those details. Um, 
so obviously huge amounts of data moving back and forth and huge amounts of data to capture and uh, uh, sad it'd be great if you could speak about this from a, a data governance point of view and how does a government or a regional jurisdiction like a province um go about actually securing this data because it has its own set of unique challenges for authorities who've not necessarily got experience of handling data perhaps you could speak to that for us yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, colleagues earlier, Charlie, Sean, and Suzanne, uh, very nicely is at the scene explaining how there are so many different components to this, the vehicle, the infrastructure, the road users. Within that, I think even if I were to take a subset of emergency response, like fire, police, and ambulance, and the huge potential that this whole data has for governments and municipal level to improve the efficiencies to that end. But what I want to touch on is, uh, before I go into the need of that interoperability and data governance part of it, also what kind of new data are we dealing with? For example, the in-cabin ca in cameras uh, that's looking at the passenger or the whole vehicle or vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to everything communication that your colleagues were mentioning earlier, uh, the veh vehicle movements and the traffic signs and road condition uh, data. And then also the biometric, biological or health sensors that are now used and uh, through the use of fingerprints, for example. So these are the all new kinds of data that, and, and to Sean's point, uh, how critical infrastructure is as well, where a lot of uh, municipalities and governments are at the forefront of uh, this too and critical to this. It is crucial to have some sort of uh, governance uh, mechanism or uh, principles that largely speaks to these new kinds of data sets. And not only that, I think another thing I would like to say is, we what we don't realize is also the amount of data that's going to be generated with all these connected vehicles coming into play. So the readiness of, of um, data usability and the interoperability between the systems and, and, the, and the more, more importantly, having some, some sort of broader principles that work through with all these stakeholders that are into play, the vehicle, the road users, the infrastructure is definitely crucial. And, and one of the things, for example, Oven through its R&D programs and and collaboration with a lot of different regions is looking and creating such, such testing and piloting environments where such scenarios could be tested and improve uh, or guide uh, and inform the ways this collaboration could be enhanced when it comes to data of this sort and this nature. Uh, but just going back to, uh, to, uh, to the whole um, gist of it uh, as well, the new concept that we keep on hearing, the smart city and how it uh, adds a lot of value to the quality of life there again, uh, it's not just within the ecosystem of auto, automotive uh, mobility and transportation, but how it connects to the bigger picture of the, the future that we're heading into the smart cities to improve quality of life people. So uh, there is definitely um, a need as more data and new data is being generated, as more um, experience of experiments and new deployments are being conducted, there are new, new use cases and there are new kind of data sets that uh, require more collaboration uh, that would help and facilitate and accelerate uh, this kind of uh, adoption. I said thanks very much. And uh, Jeff, you've you've spoken about the need to make data sovereign, and uh, I'd, I'd love for you to expand on, on on what you mean by that. And also, if you could, um, more, more more specifically, and I know an area that obviously you do a tremendous amount of work on is on the infrastructure side and. You know, Charlie's spoken about the need for roadside units or RSUs, and um, obviously there's a, there's a huge investment, there's a huge amount of work to be done here. Um, perhaps you could talk about what we need in order to make things cooperative and and uh, an intelligent system. Well, yeah, absolutely. So I, I think all the comments shared have, have been fabulous. I think the the only thing I would I would highlight though is I, I do agree with um, Suzanne that um, the POCs and pilots of just one intersection or two intersections or even a dozen intersections can have impact. That's that's what has led us to 900,000 deaths. I mean, we, we've had 5.9 gigahertz in the hands of technologists for 20 years. We've have over, I mean, what's 50 million injuries in the US over the that, that period. And on top of that, the Insurance Association says that there's been 10 trillion, trillion with a T, of economic loss because of those injuries and the, the gridlock that's been caused. And by not deploying at scale, what does it, what is it rewarded USDOT with? A loss is 60% of their spectrum. So and remember, this is not a challenge just for USDOT. It's a challenge for 
building out 5G across our country. It's a challenge for building out broadband across our country. It's a challenge for building a terrestrial-based GPS system in our country. And without solving it with scale, and I'm telling you that there are tens of billions of dollars of infrastructure funds that will underwrite these projects because they now see in clarity, it's not just about one use case at the intersection. Because as soon as you deploy at the intersection, the RSU, guess what? The carriers want to deploy there. The cameras want to deploy there. The LIDARs want to deploy there. The compute wants to deploy there. And if we solve that challenge and build this new asset class, which we call PINs or intelligent infrastructure, it's going to create this massive build out that is already occurring in China, already occurring in Italy, already occurring in other, you know, like Korea. And um, we as a nation, are falling far behind. And I'll make a statement that if we don't build out at scale, we will not be a 21st century you know, uh, community in the next 10 years, I mean, without that. And that goes back to the data because we talk about three things. We talk about solving the infrastructure challenge at the edge, but then you talk about data exchange because the other challenge that cities have is like data to them is like a hot potato. They really don't, they want to leverage it, but they don't want to house it because in, especially in the US, it um, lends them to open record request. So without the P3, a public-private partnership, which allows more bounds to be put around the data so the city is not liable, or without allowing it to be transaction. So if you can create a data exchange that allows data to be shared, now all of a sudden financial transactions to, can start occurring between OEMs, between start cities, and all the other um, applications. And um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with an organization called Gaia X out of out of the European, um, but we're bringing, we're launching three hubs for Gaia X in the United States in the next month, and that is to basically house the massive amounts of data that's going to be created at the edge, which is around transportation and smart city and IoT devices. The way you have to think about it is, you know, there was a time that we used to actually have to pay for local phone calls. Remember. You know, we actually had to pay. Now, um, what people are are not realizing is what's going to happen is things like broadband are just going to be given because what's going to happen is we're going to end up with 10 to 20 to 100 times more devices on the network providing data that becomes the economic engine that basically is going to rapidly absorb all this, this build out across the United States and across the world. And I'm not sure if I answered, but but data sovereignty is key because you want the data to say local. So the, the key thing is if you bring, if you talk about all these, like think about right now, these autonomous cars drive around, people are not aware, they are collecting massive amounts of personal identifiable data. Um, and if you flip it to infrastructure, you want that data to now be encrypted and secure, and you want to immediately eject anything that personal identifiable, but allow that other data to stay persistent over time to allow resilient, safe, you know, transportation and keep pedestrians safe, you know, at intersections. I would like to just quickly jump here, here uh, on Jeff's uh, uh, session on P3. I cannot agree more, Jeff. I, I believe that, especially in this situation, we were dealing with road users, the vehicles or the type of different transportation modes and the infrastructure. There is no, there, there cannot be another way of bringing the three together, which are crucial yeah. to this. So, um, just wanted to jump in there for the P3 suggestion that you made there. Great, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, um, I mean, just just great commentary on the importance of this. And I said thanks for the comment on on the P3 side. Suzanne, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on on public private partnerships and, and your experience of uh, what makes them work. Uh, I do. I'm not sure. A lot of the so so. Um, one of the things that I've been very interested in is, um, is, is tolling, right? I have my back, part of my background that I didn't mention is in tolling in the tolling industry. And I think that there's a lot of overlap and, you know, in, in that, in, if a vehicle can have equipment in it, that is transmitting data to the infrastructure in order to prevent a crash, it can also use that same tool to pay tolls. Because if it's so tight that if it's uh, centimeter level accuracy to prevent a crash, we can know exactly where it is to pay tolls and to do road use charge. So um, I lead the SAE committee to um, develop standards for V2X based tolling. 
And so we published the standard for, um, for, uh, for tolling, for V2X based tolling in June. And we're currently working on the standard for road use charge. Um, and, that, and we're hoping to have that done by the end of this year. That message set can be um, used on direct, on direct communications. So, um, you know, based on the five nine spectrum or also um, it can message that can be used for telematics based communication, which is, you know, a little bit slower speed, right? And that's um, vehicle back to automotive manufacturer. And so that is the goal of, of several agencies, especially on the West Coast, is to be able to do payments over V2X and larger scale and rock. So I am not directly answering your question about P3, but I am in a roundabout way answering your question about how we can get quicker deployment. And I've always seen tolling and road use charge as, as a possibility for doing that. And that has also worked in Japan. Um, where they have used road use charge and tolling as, as a way of, of getting larger scale deployments. Um, and so, um, and so I, I think very interesting that tolling was probably the first connected vehicle application that we ever saw. And so we already have um, fairly well established systems at the tolling agencies for collecting revenue and um, for billing for billing users. I think that maybe automotive OEMs are looking at that also as a possibility. And so I think that if we look at um, telematics or at direct communications, you know, that's a that's a really nice way. And some of those are P3. So maybe I kind of sort of answered your question. <laughs> uh, it, it's all good. Yeah, the um, yeah, I've always felt the transitions with electrification and, and automated driving are, right. are going to kind of ha happen in simpatico. And and obviously, when you when you look at fuel tax uh, kind of disappearing from from gas, and how do you re how do you replace that on electricity as they become EVs? Well, there's a you know the pay per use uh, is you know comes with the and that and that becomes you know specifically um, important in California, which has set you know a, a limit of twenty thirty five for combustion engine sales, right? So we see a necessary it becomes necessary really fast there to do exactly what you just said, Nino. You know? Great, awesome. Well, th thank you very much for that. Um, Ch Charlie, you've been involved in a, a number of real world deployments of cooperative systems, and it, it'd be great if you could share some of the insights and, and learnings uh, from those uh, from those deployments, proof of concept notwithstanding. <clears throat> I guess, and uh, appreciate it, I, I think this kind of relates to the previous question too, is, is kind of preparing what, you know, from a PVP perspective, uh, and I'll give one example. Um, so at Oxmart Ways, uh, we have huge deployments and we do play an integrated role in China. Uh, so we do work with the cities and, and local governments, municipalities, et cetera. Um, and, uh, but in the US, uh, we have a little bit of a different approach um, just because of some, some of the challenge people in this panel discussed about. Um, but uh, for example, we won a uh, mobility grant uh, through the Michigan's Office of, oh my God, all these different acronyms, mobility, uh, electrification, future electrification and mobility uh, and it was in a grant to deploy connected intersections uh, connected intersections being uh, equipping a intersection with a roadside unit uh, and then having a vehicle a v2x enabled vehicle uh, and doing things like uh, sending messages like uh, in the v2x standards uh, basic safety messages uh, spat messages so signal phase and timing map messages which are basically geometric layouts um, and then also uh, tim messages which 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 uh, sometimes we call in vehicle signage so then communicating the signs that you see on the road directly into the vehicle in, in, in the dashboard. Uh, and so we won that grant and, and it was again, similar to a PPP model, I would say a very exemplary. Uh, and we were kind of given free range to you know deploy and, and discuss with the city. And I would say in this process, we've noticed um, kind of what was discussed uh, about you know a, a single intersection versus a large scale deployment is that when we get down to even just deploying three intersections is our, is our target, um, you know, we get into various levels of discussion that are really not related to necessarily um, the devices and and the and let's say using the devices. Uh, and I would say the first category is uh, how well prepared the city and the infrastructure is uh, on the network space. And I kind of piggyback off of Jeff's, Jeff's comment here uh, is that we we see that I mean you know cameras have been deployed in intersections for a long time. And, and, and we see that when we bid for projects with governments and DOTs, it's, it's a single bid for putting up a camera for solving a specific or multiple use cases. Right? But, the, but the issue is then when we get into this transformative technology, we are now not only synchronizing the vehicle on, on all its standards and the infrastructure and all its standards, you're also working on the network level. 
uh, and we see a significant, uh, even maybe difference between regions. Obviously, there's a big expertise in China from a DOT and ITS perspective uh, from cities. You know, they have whole departments, ITS, right? You know, huge departments. Uh, but we also see a little bit of difference between U.S. and Canada. Uh, you know, in Canada, we notice there's a lot of, of, of a, a higher number of network expertise in the cities. Uh, and that's where we see, right, where we're talking about the edge locating data. Really, the key of this aspect of the technology is how transformative and how integratable it is. Uh, and that, like was discussed, takes a lot of data and a lot of network that previously cities seem, seems to me, from our experience, have not been ready for. Uh, nor, nor, you know, an, an analogy uh, when we talk about edge, for example, is when we talk when, when we talk to the cities and maybe in North America, the edge guy is not really your IT guy who's solving your 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 issues at your 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 computers or things like that. He's really focusing on creating a network for the city of creating all the internet, all the things that are connected to the internet. Uh, so I would say uh, the network space and the spectrum relating both to policy, federal and and local, but also like what Sean discussed, how you get into the policy of the security aspect, right? Authenticating is also related to that. Uh, the second side part of it is talent. Uh, you know, as it relates to then actually using the de or, or deploying the devices, uh, you have obviously the integrators, but we see that the integrators also don't have any really say on the network side or the very different groups, even perhaps different segments and the network people also tend to have different departments that all have different roles and responsibilities uh, in the area. Uh, and so not only does the person, let's say, have to maybe know some programming or computer, you know, computer science language, but they also now have to know standards. And these standards, again, are across industries. And that makes it, you know, not very challenging because this is pretty specialized um, language, messages, and technologies uh, that are now all, you know, converging together. Uh, and so we see that as a very difficult, you know, issue when you're talking with cities. Now you get not only about the technology, oh, this is a wireless device, but now we really also need to talk about networks because without that and where the messages are communicating, it's pretty hard to, to justify it. And that communication doesn't always, again, involve uh, the technology. It's also something regulatory and policy, uh, and, and both from a higher level perspective policy as well as down to the, you know, individual managers level, let's say. But we hope that, uh, you know, we, we do view that V2X is this catalyst, our CITS is this catalyst to really transition from, let's say, a more analog society to a digital uh, society. Charlie, thanks very much indeed for that. And um, a, a good time for us to talk a little further around the, the connectivity side of things. And um, uh, it, it, we typically focus laser-like on the Canadian market, but we've uh, intentionally had three three speakers from, from the US on this panel today because of the relationship. And you know, because Canada also often follows US regulations and standards and obviously the importance of a continental standards uh, can super important um, and and Suzanne if I could invite you to chat about some of the li limited factors from connectivity and, and I'd like to open this up to to, to Jeff and, and Sean as well to to expand on but perhaps you could kick us off uh, Suzanne. Right I'm happy to so um, yes there are limiting factors in connectivity so um, as Jeff mentioned um, uh, um, not too long ago, our Federal Communications Commission limited our bandwidth from 75 megahertz, which was allocated in November of 1999, to 30 megahertz, which is not a lot of space um, uh, to, to be able to execute to be able to execute uh, transactions and to be able to send messages. Right. So, keeping in mind the time, because this is certainly a drama that that is worthy of its own webinar, maybe a history book. I'm not sure. Um, we'll say that uh, th there are efforts now to move forward with what we can do in that 30 megahertz and how we can support um, the um, infrastructure owners and operators in where they want to be able to to be able to deploy some minimum level of connectivity, a minimum level of applications in that 30 megahertz. Um, our automotive OEM friends, Ford, has announced that they will do a full scale deployment of um, CV2X. Um, uh, on their vehicles, and so we're looking forward to that. Um, we haven't had any other announcements on full-scale deployments from any OEMs. 
uh, for use of the, the 30 megahertz and the 5.9 spectrum. So for the very least, at our practice, we're also at AECOM looking for other ways of doing connectivity. So for example, we're supporting telematics perhaps for applications that are not, um, that don't require uh, high, low latency, right? So some of the applications that the ITS America study and early studies from DOT and, and our friends in the industry are showing us that we can probably do basic safety message transmissions. So this is one of the earliest standard messages um, for those not deep in the connected vehicle communication space. It's one of the early messages and it's a message that describes the vehicle's location and a few other attributes that will um, can communicate vehicle to vehicle uh, uh, to help prevent crashes. So it looks like we can do that. And we can do some, at least some basic um, um, spat signal phase and timing and some basic map messages in that 30 megahertz. Probably not capable, probably, probably, um, I mean, no one knows for sure. We haven't, it's not complete study, but probably not able to do some of the large automation communications to enable vehicles to communicate um, in, in, to support automation and vehicle movement and cooperative automation. Probably not uh, capable to do that in 30 megahertz. So we're looking for other ways of doing that. Um, telematics is one. Um, there's also um, Verizon and Samsung both have a mech based solution. Um, uh, this is a solution that involves um, uh, um, their 5G, well, it could be their 4G, 5G, 6G, any type of communication systems on the edge of a system and taking data from a, a device in the vehicle and being able to communicate with the infrastructure and also involving cloud type decisions, super fast cloud type decisions. And um, so, so they're doing some great work there. So we're looking forward to being able to um, use all of those solutions now, instead of looking at a problem and trying to figure out the best direct connected vehicle solution. Now we're trying to figure out how to integrate all of our tools to, to solve those problems. I'll, I'll chime in as well um, to the limiting, maybe more from also from the, the, the device manufacturer's perspective. Um, so one thing obviously is, is the fact that it, it's mobile technology, uh, meaning if you, for example, analogy of smartphones, right, you have multiple generations for the 4G, 5G, 6G even, right, and, and these are tend to be not mm, either forward or backward compatible, uh, meaning that from a device manufacturer, we have to use multiple chipsets uh, and modules, uh, so we have one chipset for 4G, one chip for 5G, and then for the future, right, um, so these, these are quite limiting in the fact that it's a challenge that, you know, as we deploy devices, you have to think about the lifespan of it and the life cycle of it. And also now thinking of like how, where we switch our phones, right? Uh, more use cases, more applications, more functions in your phone, similar to that on the infrastructure. And now also, you know, on the vehicle side, uh, and then also, you know, on the network side. So thinking of small cells, for example, right? Where where network connectivity will fall in the future uh, is is a big is a big challenge. I think that cities vehicle manufacturers need also to consider in terms of how rollouts go out in the future. Uh, another piece, obviously related to that, is interoperability. Taking that same analogy of the phone, uh, right? You have T-Mobile, Verizon, Bell's, Rogers, uh, Atalus, etc. Right, you you not necessarily have a phone that can communicate across all those. You now have also direct to satellite communication, right? Uh, so all utilizing all this and and understanding what are the different mm, channels and bandwidth, etc., to communicate uh, will will get even more uh, expansive as more devices use the network, increasingly number of devices, and as as Jeff mentioned, increasing number of cities have broadband or a network or, or societies. Um, so from an interoperability perspective, then, you know, as a device manufacturer, that's a piece where somewhere like an Omnier, like um, um, Suzanne mentioned, is very, very beneficial. And that's also kind of related to that, to the previous question of how, how to accelerate the deployment. And again, as industry is collaborating, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, individual technical standards, like on, on how to prevent ha uh, cybersecurity or hacking, right, is not enough for, for, for actual deployment and implementation. Right. And that's where you can get into right now. Another limiting factor is how you prepare, how do you actually test something that is very specific to the environment, to people's behavior, which is very complex in a, let's say, a pre pre deployment environment. Right. You talk about proving grounds or test beds or testing facilities. Right. Or pilot corridors. Right. Where they're blocking and geofencing areas. Those are all very beneficial. But to actually get like we talked about to a smart city solution, you know. 
unless you build a fake city, um, right now you can do simulation, which is a very big benefit. But in terms of getting actual real data and the, and the erratic behaviors and the many differences of all the different road lengths and segments, it really takes you know a, a commitment from a city because there's you can't really create right a fake city to to test this. It's either it's either in the real world or in a closed you know a separate environment. So that's where I see you know if there are more spaces where we really test right, and the city is saying, hey, out of these winners for the mobility challenge, we will pick one to deploy in the city. A full wide scale. We we as a device manufacturer would love to see um, an opportunity like that. But those are some of the challenges yeah. that we see. Right. Thank you very much, Charlie. A question from from the audience on um, on on connectivity. I understand that five G supports short range device to to device connectivity without the need for infrastructure. Um, Sean, um, Jeff, Susanna, any of the other panelists, would you care to comment on that? Do, do we need additional infrastructure if uh, 5G is in place? Um, I guess I have to understand the context, but the densification of infrastructure is happening with or without anybody's participation. I mean, it's just kind of like the McKinsey argument that there was only going to be 2,000 cell towers in the 1980s. We have 450,000 now. The lowest estimate of densification across the U.S. is 1.5 million nodes, and those nodes will support all kinds of different technologies. And as far as on 5.9 you know, gigahertz, I'm, I'm, we are not the least bit worried about spectrum for really broadband channels. In fact, we've been working with the federal agencies and we see a clear path to over two gigahertz of bandwidth to be able to be applied to these advanced um, applications and services. So where 5.9 was given specifically as a, a specific frequency, because that was back when the technology did not exist to allow um, the baseband processing to occur. But now we can actually allow a single radio head, a single antenna head to talk um, at, like a Rosetta Stone to many, many different systems. So it's gonna take a 10 year journey, but we'll eventually have just one massive radio at each of these, um, these locations that then all the carriers and all the applications feed off of for their services and functionality. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Sean, uh, be, be good to actually talk about a, a, a live example and a live rollout. Obviously, you mentioned that uh, Korea is uh, quite advanced and the city of uh, Juju, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, um, conducted a, a CITS pilot on 300 kilometers of road. And I wonder if you could speak about the rental fleet that was involved in that deployment, the onboard units, and some of the the, the R issues that they use for that uh, quite significant uh, uh, endeavor. Okay, so um, the CITS project held in Jeju Island was uh, like one good example, which was handled in Korea. So because it's very uh, limited and closed environment, as it's an island, and we can deploy as it's most one of the well-known um, tourist attraction, like one of the most famous like tourist visiting um, area. So we have a lot of like new sort of technology based like service for the mobility. So actually on um, this project in Jeju involves a number of like large number of the vehicles, some of them is emergency vehicles like, like ambulance and other um, or like, you know, normal vehicles. There are a lot of like potential opportunities for the aftermarket devices as uh, V2X devices could be um, retrofitted on the rental cars, taxi fleets, and all other um, micro mobilities, including kickboard, electric bicycle, and bicycles, and the other fleet operators could benefit from the V2X ecosystem without the need to invest in the latest vehicle model. So we could talk on um, like this, um, you know, aftermarket sort of um, V2X capabilities deploying into the vehicle not from the like original equipment. So this way to X ecosystem without the need to invest in, like we, this is like, like this aftermarket device is this whole like, like separate session for, um, is a lot of new like potential business opportunities, new target devices and other use cases. When we especially looking into like mass, some mobility as a service that we could um, make a benefit of setting up the V2X infrastructure and capability itself. <clears throat> and even on top of it, uh, we have involved in like, more than like, the like, Jeju Island project is one of the like good example we have in handle 
like you know nationwide sort of like um, project which is handled by the like, Ministry of Land Infrastructure and Transportation of Korea was the first trial um, in like word to establish a nationwide authentication system that integrates and synchronize with existing six regional CITS implementations. And this project was like accumulating of uh, pre previous um, deployment in this country as it was the huge and unique system of a large scale with um, the certain unique requirements and the specifics. So uh, the, this like system covers not only for the, like a small island for the like nationwide Korea itself. So 5,000 kilometers of nationwide highways that are going to be in the sea ice capable in the coming few years, including all the benefits and mobility services and new type of vehicles and even electric cars connecting new infrastructure and that will change the entire mobility ecosystem of Korea and safe with um, secure guaranteed CITA. So like before market and after market, when we are thinking of V2X capability deployment, not even for the vehicle itself and including mobility, like new mobility service and also for the infrastructure, there's a lot of new um, sort of like potential opportunities creating new business cases for the users. Dawn, thanks for, for sharing that example for us with, with us. Um, Asad, I'm going to give, give you the last um, the last comment on the panel, and would love to um, know how. One of the questions that came in is how do we avoid the kind of public backlash that uh, the Google Sidewalks Labs project experienced from a from a, a data point of view, and uh, also if you can comment on the work that uh, Ontario is doing with with Michigan in in terms of the MOD that you're working on. Yeah, thank you for that question. And I know we are sure pressed with time, so I'll try to uh, tackle it as quickly as I can. To your first question, I would say uh, one of the important things in all of this work as these are emerging technologies, there are a lot of opportunities and there are a lot of um, spaces where uh, new things emerge and uh, very quickly um, a new technologies reshape. And even with computing of some of the people, uh, some of the people mentioned here, uh, within a short span of, uh, span of time, things have evolved very quickly. So what's important is really, and I'm gonna tie this to the last question you've asked, it's important to have these pre-deployment um, uh, places, um, corridors, test beds, pilots that can effectively really test um, and see uh, what the kind of different use cases uh, before deployment that could really help shape uh, and align all of these different B3 stakeholders that we've been talking about. And Oven is really at the heart of this as well, that where it brings the academia, the researchers, the government together to make sure that such pre-deployment corridors and test pits are created to ensure that we test these new technologies sufficiently and also generate new opportunities and build those on those opportunities with that mindset um, uh, to, to help and avoid such things where uh, we could have potential backlash of sorts. But I think what, what I want to highlight uh, here as well, uh, Nino, to your question of, of the great work on the uh, cross-border work that we are doing in Michigan, just very briefly, I think just for the audience to understand, we are, we are looking at almost a trillion uh, dollars worth of trade between US and Canada, but also between Ontario and Michigan specifically responsible for about 22% of the North America's automotive output. What I, wanna, I want the audience to imagine, the transportation of people and goods going through these corridors. So that massive scale is a good test bed uh, to test these future technologies and to be able to come up with these holistic solutions. And in that very light, the Ontario government through OVEN and um, uh, the state of Michigan through MDOT has signed this MOU to have these cross-border testing uh, feasibility studies done so we can effectively test, test these at the borders. So I'm just gonna stop there. It's a massive topic and I can go into a lot of details, but I'm mindful of everyone's time here. Asad, thanks very much. And um, like it, we've, the time is like literally flown by. Massive thanks to all the panelists, um, Sean, Suzanne, Jeff, Charlie, and, and Asad, and to, to all the audience uh, for your questions. We, we've, um, we, we're going to endeavour to answer your questions afterwards and to put them to the panellists and make sure you, you get some responses. Um, and, and clearly, it's we've got many more sessions to do on this to address the many layers of issues. But massive thanks to the speakers for setting the scene. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'd like to 
uh, once again give a big thanks to our sponsoring partner Autocrypt, um, a leader in uh, automotive mobility cybersecurity, uh, for coming on board to um, uh, sponsor this session and to make it possible. And finally, in, in wrapping up, uh, we'd just like to highlight that next week we have a three part webinar series on alternative fuels and their use in medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, we're not going to be able to electrify these heavy duty vehicles fast enough, and there are some good options to decarbonize our operations right now. So please uh, find the link on our website and, uh, and, and sign up for that uh, if you'd like to join us. Thanks very much, and uh, see you at the next event.